back in 89, it was kind of a, what I call a sleepy little village. It's like what you hear about in terms of ideal small towns. We didn't lock our doors. I can tell you that it was a very comfortable, quiet community until our son was kidnapped and everything changed. A child that was absolutely snatched away off the street where he lived by a masked gunman, never to be seen again. They just told me that the uh, guy uh, got a hold of Jacob and told them to run into the woods. A year ago today, Jacob Wetterling was Mar kidnapped. Was the, ninth. Uh, the morning after Jacob was taken. And so even being in shock, even being completely overwhelmed, they're in front of the cameras from day one. It looked like a happy enough Halloween party, but this is a time of very real fear for the people of St. Joseph, and this song is their one source of comfort. It's Jacob Wetterling's favorite. The search for the boy has been massive. It's the most feared type of abduction, one by a complete stranger, no ransom note, no contact. This is where it happened, less than a mile from Jacob's house. It's back over that way. Jacob, his little brother, and one other boy had gone to a convenience store to rent a videotape. When they reached this spot, they saw the man dressed in black holding the gun. Jacob's brother, Trevor. He told us to put our bikes in the ditch and lay down, and then we did that. He asked them their ages. Jacob answered 11, and these two boys were then told to run away. This entire community and several surrounding towns are helping in the search for Jacob and comforting his family. His mother, Patty, deeply moved by the prayers offered at this weekend vigil. Come soon. He had to feel that, you guys. He's coming home soon. It, it was instant panic. I mean, we were but in touch with it right away. I truly believed he'd be, he'd be back by morning. I just, I couldn't, I can't fathom this. Everywhere around the world, the heartbeat sounds the same. Day after day, Jacob's song is sung and played here. Each day that brings hope also brings another day of, of loneliness. And Jacob Wetterling was kidnapped. The FBI announced there was another victim. And these facts match up with Jacob's abduction. Nine months before Jacob was taken, a 12-year-old boy named Jared was walking home at night in neighboring Cold Spring. This uh, guy had stepped out of the vehicle. Uh, approached me from behind, said, I have a gun, I'm not afraid to use it. The man, who had a police scanner in his car, drove Jared to this remote site, sexually assaulted him, then let him go. I was dropped off and told to run, uh, don't look back, or he would shoot. It's a threat almost identical to the one described by Jacob's friend, Aaron. He grabbed Jacob and then he told me to run as fast as I could into the woods or else he'd shoot. For Jared, the weeks after the Wetterling abduction were filled with grueling interviews with law enforcement. They brought me to a point where I broke down, where I mentally broke down, you know, just physically exhausted, and I didn't have the answer, and they wanted the answer, and I couldn't provide that. So my parents made that decision um, that we should move. Jared left Cold Spring. Oh, uh, what is this? <laughs> he had to have been Pretty young, less than a year. And his first haircut? Yeah, it was a curl and just kind of... Jacob is Patty and Jerry Wetterling's oldest son. <laughs> Jerry put them on top of the refrigerator. I don't know why. They were just being silly. These pictures and the memories are all they have left of Jacob. This is when he had the broken arm. Um, he just knew his arm wouldn't hurt if he had a puppy. He was abducted, they think, by a total stranger. The shirt he was actually wearing. The rarest kind of kidnapping. Oh, this is his parakeet. These are happy thoughts. Um, but when you stop to think about how much time has gone by, it's... Um, skirts of his hometown of St. Joseph, a young boy's mysterious disappearance is far from forgotten. We know someone has information. It was nearly 25 years ago that 11-year-old Jacob Wetterling was abducted along a dark rural road not far from his house. He was on his bike along with his brother and a friend. The gunman asked each boy their age and let them go except for Jacob. Today, local, state, and federal investigators, along with Jacob's parents, appealed for information once again. This time, it will appear on six billboards, from St. Cloud to St. Joe, Cold Spring, and Painesville. There's a lot of people who need answers beyond just our family. I think the entire state 
needs to know what happened to Jacob. Where are you? Who did this? The donated billboards will feature Jacob's picture age enhanced for what he may look like today. Father Jerry Wetterling says the key could be in something as innocent and simple as an overheard conversation. But it's usually something that comes from the public that triggers their ability to, uh, to respond. So, um, so I urge you to listen and then um, call. For Jerry and Patty Wetterling, hope is never lost. At what point do you give up? I, I, I just couldn't do that. We were all in that church service that night. The same place they gathered in 1989 when Jacob was taken. After these many years of praying and holding on the Lord for Jacob. The prayers were different on this night. Herb and Darlene Beck told hoped for a long time that Jacob Wetterling would be found safe. Of course, from that moment on, life changed because you were afraid to let your kids go for a bike ride, alone you were afraid to let your kids go out of your sight. As the years passed by in St. Joseph, he was never far from people's hearts. For Jacob. Everybody in this community has been talking about him all day and our whole, my whole life. Lindsay Vitacek doesn't know the family, but she cares, visiting the last place Jacob was seen alive. I just wanted to show support for Patty and the Wetterlings and just give some kind of love. Jacob, I'm so sorry. It's incredibly painful to know his last days. Today, That's after 27 years, days. Patty Wetterling finally learned what happened to her son, Jacob, who disappeared when he was only 11 years old, leaving their small town in Minnesota shell-shocked and the rest of the country horrified. This was one more day of agony for St. Joseph, Minnesota, population 3,200. In a federal courthouse, Danny Heinrich described in detail how he says he kidnapped and sexually abused the young boy. According to reporters in court, Heinrich told the judge, I was driving on a dead end road. I noticed three children on their bicycles with a flashlight. At the time, Jacob's brother described how the two of them and a friend were held at gunpoint. He told us to put our bikes in the ditch and lay down. Heinrich says he drove away with Jacob, handcuffing him. The boy asked, what did I do wrong? Heinrich told the court he sexually abused Jacob and then shot him at the edge of the woods. Investigators did question Heinrich at the time, but there was never an arrest. It would take nearly three decades for a break in the case. Heinrich's DNA discovered on a sweatshirt of another victim abducted around the same time. Police searched his home, leading to an arrest on child pornography charges. After almost 27 years, Danny Heinrich was willing to talk and we had to grab the moment. The 53-year-old told police where he buried Jacob's body in exchange for not being charged with the murder. Heinrich still faces 20 years in prison after pleading guilty on the pornography charges. The Wetterlings agreed to the deal to bring an end to their tireless search. For us, Jacob was alive until we found, until we found him. Now they have excruciating answers to the tragedy that has consumed their lives along with fresh grief, even after all this time. On Wednesday, Danny Heinrich led FBI agents to the spot where he buried Jacob Wetterling's body and clothing. And for the past three days, authorities have dug with a backhoe and shovels along a tree line, just a few hundred yards from a farmhouse in a lush green pasture filled with grazing cattle. Those who saw the work going on thought nothing of it. It's unbelievable that it could be 250, 300 yards away and he had no idea. Now neighbors are shocked by the evil that was perpetrated in such a peaceful rural setting. Shocking, it's really shocking that something like this could happen so close to you and you don't even realize. Do you think it was Danny Heinrich? I, yeah, I do. Adam Klopaki's story is part of a lawsuit that accuses Wetterling investigators of focusing on the wrong guy. Klopaki thinks his information could have nabbed the real kidnapper, Danny Heinrich, much sooner, for the first time tonight on television. He spoke with Esme Murphy about his frustration as the case went unsolved for nearly 27 years. It never made sense to me that he had never been here before. It just wouldn't, 
It just doesn't add up. Back in 1989, Adam Klopaki was 14 and a friend of Jacob's. We, we both love sports, so. Adam's story of what happened to him and a 12-year-old friend six weeks before Jacob was taken on the same street walking home from the same convenience store is now a major section of a lawsuit against three key Wetterling investigators. As the two boys walked down this street in September of 1989, a speeding car began following them. He seems like he's doing 60, 70. We're, we started running. They ran into Adam's friend's open garage and cowered there as the car pulled in and sat there, its high beams pointing at them. We're just sitting in the in the driveway, like, what's going on? You know, this is crazy. And then he backed up into that person's driveway. The car stayed several minutes and then left. Days after Jacob's abduction, they and their parents went to Wetterling Investigators. Again, that we give a good description of the car, a good description of the man driving the car, and that we could identify him in a lineup. The boys did not know it then, but the car they described would end up matching the description of the blue Ford EXP Danny Heinrich drove the night of Jacob's kidnapping. And in 2015, when Adam finally saw his 1989 statement to Wetterling investigators, he was stunned to see his description of the driver match that of Danny Heinrich. Do you think it was Danny Heinrich? I, yeah, I do. Despite the fact that Danny Heinrich was almost immediately a prime suspect in Jacob's case, Adam and his friend never took part in any lineup. For 15 years, Adam tried to stop thinking about what had happened. But then in 2004, he saw a new story. Investigators had a new theory. They had become convinced Jacob's kidnapper was on foot, not in a car, and there was a new suspect. We've learned investigators are again questioning an area school teacher. Investigators had turned their entire focus to investigate band teacher Dan Rassier. The televised story contained a plea from Patty Wetterling for information. And I saw no. Patty come on the news. That was the, that was the kicker. And so in 2004, Adam again came forward about what happened to him in 1989. And did you tell them you thought it was the same guy? Yeah. And what happened? I, I wanted them to come with me uh, so I could show them, you know, our route and what we did. They didn't want to do it. Aaron Larson is sharing his reaction to the news. What can... I add to this equation that can maybe piece everything together. Aaron was 11 years old in 1989, the same age as Jacob. He is now 37 and living in southwest Minnesota. WCCO's Liz Collin is just back from meeting him. And Liz, it was the Wetterlings who actually called Aaron Larson to tell them about this arrest last week. Yeah, right? that's right, Amelia. It was Aaron Larson told me today that it was one week ago he got the call from them. The day before, Danny Heinrich was publicly named as a person of interest in Jacob Wetterling's kidnapping. Aaron says as soon as he saw Heinrich's photo, he felt differently than he did about any other photo he'd been shown in the past. He believes Heinrich's voice will be the most telling of all. He has yet to hear it. Says investigators have never contacted him to ask him anything about Heinrich, but when he looked at all of the paperwork himself and read the news reports, it seems to make sense. My gut feeling is when you piece things together and, you know, his history and a lot of the evidence, it kind of points that way, but you just got to never give up looking for answers and getting more information from him. After that. Aaron Larson told me it wasn't until a blogger, Joy Baker, contacted him about the sexual assaults in the Painesville area that he knew they ever even happened. He still has yet to talk to Jared Shirell. Investigators found Heinrich's DNA on Jared's shirt after he was sexually assaulted months before. Confession, Rassier filed a lawsuit against Stearns County and specific investigators. He's seeking at least $2 million in damages. Rassier says the former sheriff retaliated against him for speaking critically about the Wetterling investigation. The new Stearns County Sheriff told us today active litigation keeps him from commenting on why Rassier was looked at so closely. But in the more than 40,000 documents released today, we did find an extensive collection of pictures related to Rassier from his farm property to several packages of potential evidence where Rassier is clearly labeled a suspect. Rassier's attorney sat in on today's press conference. We were very happy with the information that was disseminated today. He wants the truth to come out that, that these people threw him, threw him under the bus for no good reason. And today's press conference, I think, frankly, helps to solidify that fact. Some farmland in Painesville. Jacob was kidnapped at gunpoint, molested, murdered in 1989. Now the owner of the land where his body was buried is speaking with a reporter for the first time with CCO. At Investigators recovered Jacob's remains last week behind this tree. On Wednesday, deputies told the Vosses they were there to look for stolen property and ask permission to dig on their land. Voss later learned the Wetterlings were eventually led to that same tree line. Wednesday, somebody had 
had come to the farm. I wasn't home at the time, but talked with my wife and had mentioned something about uh, stolen property and interest that way and that they had asked permission to go take a look at a described area that they had uh, told her about at that time. And from that point, then more people had come later and you know, it looked to us at that point that it was more than what they had described, but um, everything, you know, kind of developed from that point. It wasn't until Friday when the Stearns County Sheriff confirmed at their kitchen table that it was Jacob they found. Voss showed us another field to give us an idea of what this land would have looked like in 1989 before cattle roamed the pasture. He says that tall grass would make it nearly impossible to see anyone coming and going, especially at night. Voss says as the landscape changed, no one would have ever been able to detect anything. During that time, the FBI determined that Heinrich's shoe prints and his car's tire tracks were consistent, but not a scientific match to the prints and tracks found at the Wetterling abduction scene. Jared Sherrill's attack was preceded by assaults on eight boys in Painesville in 1986 and 1987. Those cases were never solved, but investigators believe they are connected to Heinrich. You can only put in the back of your head, you can never get rid of it. Troy Cole was attacked and sexually assaulted a block or so from his own front door three years before Jacob was taken. Riding my bike home one night and next thing you know, you got a knife to your throat. Not knowing if you're going to live or die when you're 13, it's kind of scary. Cole says he and seven other boys who reported attacks in the late 80s weren't taken seriously by Painesville authorities. I gave a statement to city police here that night that happened, and I never heard anything back from anybody. In a document made public last year, it was revealed that Painesville's then police chief, Robert Schmaginski, contacted the Wetterling investigators in January of 1990 about the Painesville cases. He told them Danny Heinrich, who lived in Painesville at the time, was a suspect. In 2014, WCCO asked Patty Wetterling if she had known about the Painesville cases. She said, we did not know. I think the world of them, because they're how they kept it together for this many years, not knowing what happened to their kid. With all of the eight Painesville attacks happening before Jacob was taken, Cole believes Jacob could still be alive today, but he is relieved he has been found. After sources say 53-year-old Danny Heinrich led the FBI to the boy's remains. I was shocked that he actually did talk and finally came forward and let the Wetterlings have closure. Relieved for the Wetterling family, but Cole is still left with anger and sadness over what he believes could have been. There's only one unanswered question now that I want to know is why didn't they do anything about it? We've discovered some supporting documents for his claims, beginning with this report from just two days after Jacob disappeared, showing how one of the previous attempted assault victims went to investigators, informing them of, quote, seven to nine attempted molestations in Painesville. A tip that he says took two months for investigators to review. It is January 5th, 1990, before this lead sheet is checked out by a St. Cloud officer assigned to the task force. Other documents showing investigators wrongly pursuing leads from other states and even psychics until mid-January when the focus finally turned to Danny Heinrich. Investigators gave Heinrich a polygraph, placed him under surveillance and brought him in for a lineup. But that strategy also falling short, the sheriff said, by only bringing in the Cold Spring victim, not those from Painesville or St. Joseph, and not having the men speak, despite the noted distinctive voice of the suspect. There were tire prints, shoe prints, and worst of all, the sheriff said, a botched interview with Heinrich. But on all of this... You know what, Al? Why don't you take it outside? The FBI takes issue. To say that this was an uninformed interview done by incompetent people just hurts. It really hurts, and it's not true. Former FBI agent Al Garber, who led the early Wetterling investigation, said they didn't have the evidence on Heinrich. They had to pursue other suspects. We should have given up and just interviewed Heinrich again and again and again. And that's ridiculous. But as for the bottom line, Garber agrees. All of the investigators failed. Okay, we failed. If you want to hear me say we failed because we didn't find Jacob alive, we failed.
WCCO spoke with Danny Heinrich in 1996. The interview was done in his car with a hidden camera and microphone. At one point, Heinrich describes how authorities arrested him and accused him of abducting Jacob from St. Joseph in 1989. No, it's you, it's you, it's you, it's you, it's you. I know it isn't, no, it isn't, no, it isn't. WCCO also reported back then that Heinrich had failed a lie detector test. Transcripts of the interview quote him as saying he does not want to take another one. Esme Murphy looks back at the interview where Heinrich describes his encounters with police during the early days of the Wetterling investigation. There is just a brief glimpse of the back of Danny Heinrich getting into his red 1987 Mercury sedan. A hidden camera and microphone capture his conversation with a reporter. Heinrich says he doesn't know where he was the night of Jacob's abduction. I don't keep track of last week or the week before. It's probably home. In 1996, investigators showed WCCO this image of a footprint from Jacob's abduction scene and told us that it was consistent with Heinrich's shoe print. And they said this tire track was consistent with the tires on Heinrich's blue Ford EXP. During the interview and in transcripts, Heinrich says in 1989 and 1990, he was under surveillance for months. They were pure hell. This original January 1990 search warrant shows investigators search Heinrich's Painesville home looking for Jacob, his clothing, a gun, and any evidence to show where he was on the night Jacob disappeared. They also look for evidence from an earlier abduction in January of 1989. In that case, 12-year-old Jared Shirel of Cold Spring was abducted, sexually assaulted, and then let go. In the 1996 interview, Heinrich insists he knows nothing about either case. There's nothing I can tell. I have no information whatsoever. That's the truth. While 12-year-old Jared had not been able to pick Heinrich out of a photo lineup, he did help the FBI create this sketch, which bears a striking likeness to Heinrich. In February 1990, authorities arrested Heinrich and charged him in Jared's case. That is when he was accused of abducting both boys. I know it's you, it's you, it's you, it's you, it's you. I know it isn't, no it isn't, no it isn't. Until finally uh, I said I have nothing more to say until I speak to a lawyer. After that, Heinrich refused to talk. Yeah. Investigators had to drop the charges. In the interview transcripts, Heinrich says that law enforcement then followed him for months and that he became paranoid and he tried to change his appearance by growing a mustache. Haynesville, who prosecutors believe were assaulted by Heinrich in the 1980s. Tonight, we have the untold story of how one of the victims as a teenager met with Jacob Ruddling's father, Jerry, just weeks after Jacob's abduction and why. Here's Esme Murphy. I knew he'd remember me. It has been nearly 27 years since Jerry Wetterling and Chris Bertelson last saw each other. It's good to see you. Yeah, welcome back to St. Joe. <laughs> It was December 1989, just six weeks after Jacob had been abducted. Jerry Wetterling had gone back to his chiropractic practice one day a week. He remembers his life as a fog of media appearances, meetings with law enforcement, and even rumors in the community that he was somehow involved because of his religion. And he said, you got to tell me, is, is, is there anything to this rumor that Baha'i sacrificed their firstborn male? Emotionally, it just, it just killed me, you know. Chris Bertelson had just turned 16 and was living in Painesville, just 30 miles away. He remembers the moment he heard about Jacob. Immediately, I thought of, like, this stuff, this is similar to what happened to us. Could have been me. And I told my dad, or I said, you, we got we to gotta see it. Dr. Wetterling. Chris wanted to share with Jerry Wetterling that he was one of more than a half dozen Painesville boys who had been attacked, some sexually assaulted, by a man dressed in black who sometimes wore a mask, a man with a low, raspy voice, and who threatened to kill some of his victims if they told. I remember, you know, hearing the story of how he took Jacob on the bikes, and that was us. We're on bikes too. Chris and a friend were attacked in May of 1987 as they rode their bikes in downtown Painesville just after midnight. I just remember he was really fast, um, moved very quickly, uh, and, and dark clothing. What I really remember is, is the boots. The man knocked Chris's friend off his bike before running away. A newspaper article in May of 1987 in the Painesville Press asked for the public's help. Uh, most of us started carrying knives. Chris had his father make an appointment with Jerry Wetterling, who was then and is now a chiropractor. 
I said, we, we need to share this. He needs to, they need to know. He needs to know what, what happened to us. But you do remember this boy coming to you? Absolutely. I just said, you know, this, this, a lot of stuff going on here and it's, and it's reasonably close and needs to be looked at. Chris and his friend were interviewed by Wetterling investigators. They told investigators they had no idea who might have attacked them. But what Chris and the other Painesville victims didn't know is that Painesville police suspected Danny Heinrich. A document released after Heinrich's arrest in 2015 shows that Painesville Police Chief Robert Schmaginski told the Wetterling Task Force in January of 1990 that Danny Heinrich was their suspect. You got um, the police chief saying in, in January 1990 that he was the suspect. There was no lineup? No lineup. Chris Bertelson says he and his friends can't believe neither the Wetterling investigators or Painesville police ever put Danny Heinrich in a lineup in front of them, even though documents now show, and Jerry Wetterling remembers well, that in those early months, Danny Heinrich was a prime suspect in Jacob's disappearance. I know that he was a very strong suspect, very strong suspect. What do you think would have happened if you guys' cases had really been looked at? I wish I could say that they would have stopped him in Painesville, is that he would have been stopped and arrested when he was a suspect in these cases and not escalated, not escalated to Jared, not taken to you. Former Painesville Police Chief Robert Schmaginski died earlier this year. For more than two years, he refused WCCO-TV's repeated requests for an interview. Jerry Wetterling insists he does not second guess law enforcement. We had Heinrich, but we couldn't quite close the deal on him at the time. and. Even then, it's not going to bring Jacob back. Chris says he never knew Danny Heinrich personally, but now realizes that during the 1980s, his divorced parents lived right next door to Heinrich and his family at two different Painesville apartment buildings. I want it to be crystal clear that Danny Heinrich doesn't own us. Jerry Wetterling told us he didn't want to focus on Danny Heinrich or the sentencing. Jacob may be buried now, but Jerry says his short life will always transcend his final moments. Jacob's spirit was incredibly strong, and it has been part of, I think, what's got Chris here today. Yeah, I think so, too. House in a quiet Annandale neighborhood, Danny James Heinrich lived alone for the past eight years. It sits just a block from a middle school and is surrounded by neighbors with young children. Yeah, it's a shock, but he is kind of a strange guy, so, but I had no idea. Patty Peterson lives across the street and watched as FBI agents raided the home July 28th. Following that, Heinrich told his neighbors he was questioned but released over the 1989 abduction of Jacob Wetterling. He says, oh, I thought that was all done and in the past, and now here they are again. But at the time of the Wetterling case, Heinrich lived here in a former motel in Painesville, 23 miles from where Jacob disappeared. He's held a steady job at this Buffalo plywood company where investigators pulled him from the factory floor last summer for questioning. I'm just glad he's gone. Other neighbors of Heinrich, like this woman, didn't want to be identified, but say the indictment of a man she thought she knew leaves a sick feeling in her stomach. Everyone just got to talking and everyone heard about it. And he said what? That he was a suspect back in 89. They, they booked him and took his mugshot, took hair samples. And... Jacob Wetterling. It's almost consumed in the past few weeks. When Heinrich finally took the podium, those words seemed difficult to say. Mr. and Mrs. Wetterling, my heinous acts and my selfishness are unforgivable for what I've taken away from you. I'm very sorry. Heinrich paused often during his statements. He sighed heavily several times and kept his head bowed. He went on to say, many of you probably wondered how I kept this secret so long, to spare myself and the humiliation to my family. After that, Heinrich trailed off and didn't seem to be able to finish what he'd prepared to say. He walked away from the podium, shaking his head. Also in court today, Jared Sherrill, another one of Heinrich's victims. He walked out during Heinrich's apology, but told reporters outside of the court He's been waiting for this day and is grateful for all the support. It's a traumatic event that, that defines your life in, in a lot of ways and we can all learn from the lessons that uh, we heard today uh, from the Wetterling family and 
and the um, excellent words that they've shared with all of us as well. in prison for receiving child pornography. After serving his time, Heinrich will be on supervised release and must register as a sex offender. That part, punishment is part of a plea deal in exchange for confessing and finally leading investigators to Jacob's remains. Our Jennifer Merrily was in the courtroom this morning to hear the powerful victim impact statements. Yeah, for 40 minutes, the Wetterlings talked through tears. They spoke of their pain and how the choices Danny Heinrich made on that October night in 1989 led to a lifetime of heartache. Guilt, saying, I lived every day thinking I was the monster that night. I was the coward that left my friend. I was the coward that ran away. Trevor felt guilty because he was the one that pushed for the trio to ride their bikes to the store in St. Joseph. Trevor said, from the moment Jacob was taken, molested, and murdered, my life was never the same. In September, Heinrich confessed to killing Jacob, and he led the FBI to the boy's remains in this Painesville pasture. He testified that Jacob asked, what did I do wrong in his final moments? To that, Jacob's younger sister, Carmen, said, I love you, Jacob. This was not your fault, and you didn't do anything wrong. His older sister, Amy, said, although the gruesome details were devastating, the worst part is that for nearly 27 years, he let us believe that we would someday be able to see Jacob again. Jerry Wetterling expressed gratitude to everyone who got them to this point, including Heinrich, for showing them where Jacob was. He said, I miss all the things I didn't get to experience. Laugh-filled fishing outings, pride-filled school events. Patty Wetterling relayed the magnitude of pain inflicted on her family, saying, My heart hurts for Jacob and all he went through that night. It keeps me awake at night. To Heinrich, you didn't need to kill him. He did nothing wrong. He just wanted to go home. Heinrich said he is truly sorry for his evil acts. Mr. and Mrs. Wetterling, the heinous acts, the selfishness are unforgivable for what I have taken away from you. I don't know what else to say. I'm so sorry. And Heinrich said the reason he kept this secret for so long was to spare himself and the humiliation. Academy, which is the St. Cloud School District has been using for early childhood classes. The building used to be the Kennedy Community School, where Jacob was a student before he was kidnapped and killed in 1989. The city of St. Joseph will spend $6 million to build the community center there, but another $6 million will need to be raised through fundraisers. Jacob is more than just thought at this point. Uh, it's, Jacob's a spirit and he's very alive. That spirit's alive and it's touching everybody in here and has touched and is going to continue touching. Um, uh, like we've said a lot, his work's not Vietnam done yet. Veterans of Anoka started a walk to bring awareness to Jacob's abduction before Christmas in 1989. Since then, they've walked hundreds of miles in honor of Jacob and missing children. Today they took their final walk together. Kate Ratnitz was there. Kate, this had to be in a very emotional day for a lot of these guys. It really was, John. You know, the day it started somber as the group of veterans gathered for one last time for Jacob. In their past walks, the goal was always with the hope that Jacob would come home alive. Now, we all know what happened to the 11-year-old boy, and yet, even though his story didn't turn out the way any of us wanted it to, hope lives on for the veterans and the Wetterlings in the kindness and bond that they have shared over 27 years. Yeah. On a cold, quiet morning in St. Joseph, Jacob's Freedom Walk started just like the original in 1989, in prayer. We thank you for be us being able to do this walk one last time. Two months after Jacob was abducted, a newly formed group of local veterans got together to walk 61 miles from Minoka to the Wetterlings' home in St. Joseph. Mike Clark, who started the walk, was 43 years old, with an 11-year-old son the same age as Jacob. Just imagining how, how we would, Mary and I, would feel or cope, I wanted to do something. A lot's changed. Today, Clark is 70. Because of health issues, the group could only go one mile this year for the last walk from where Jacob was abducted to the Wetterlings' home. 
When they arrived at the house, the veterans presented Patty and Jerry with Jacob's Hope flag. Hand over this flag to Jerry. The same flag they've been marching with since the beginning. You guys taught us so much about never giving up. But while the walk started out of a tragedy, the day ended with a lot of laughter. <laughs> As the Wetterlings and veterans shared cookies and coffee, reminiscing on the very first walk, and sharing stories of kids, grandkids, and great grandkids, but also sharing the pain of that had sex offender registry and that was suggested as a, a good tool for law enforcement. Um, what happened very quickly is it broadened beyond a tool for law enforcement to, with Megan's law, it's like notifying communities and, and now with the internet everything's all over the place and um, I, I started getting child safety alerts now. It's like, do you know is there a sex offender in your community? And it's, it's troubling because so such a small fraction of sex offenders end up on a registry. And I can tell you that most of the suspects we've had in Jacob's case would never have been and never were on a registry. So there's a false sense of these are the bad guys when the reality is most sexual abuse happens with, within the family or within close you know, relations of, of people that you know. Um, and, and those don't end up on a sex offender registry. So we're, what really we were intending to do, I still think it's a good thing for law enforcement to know who's done this before. You, you go there and look at the usual suspects, but I think that we need to um, do a way more broader education about sex offenses and how they happen and, and how kids are mostly not taken at gunpoint. They're tricked or lured. There's just a recent article about sex trafficking and how these kids are manipulated and used. Uh, we need as a culture to recognize and uh, to protect our children better. Um, not to arrest a child for inappropriate sexual conduct and put them on a registry. That's not what the thing was designed to do. So I think that we really need to take a look at what, what, what was passed and how are we using that and is it effective. Um, I think in many cases the answer is going to be no. It's not working the way that um, it could. Don't associate with it. Like I can tell you that it's windy out and the sky is blue. Jacob's we all know the story of Jacob Wetterling, who was abducted was by a masked gunman on the road near his house in 1989. Our first guests have spent nearly four years working on a documentary about the case and how the world changed after it. But the project needs funds to get it edited and finished. Director Chris Newberry and producer Nora Shapiro are here to tell us how you can get involved. Welcome to you both. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Thank you. This story, I think whether you grew up in Minnesota or anywhere in the country, everybody knows about Jacob Wetterling. Why did you decide to make a movie about this? Well, I am a Minnesota kid. I grew up in Minnesota, right here in the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. And I, I was 14 years old when uh, Jacob went missing. And I remember it vividly. It really affected me, just like any other person in Minnesota and this part of the country. Yeah. It was just really impactful, and I thought, you know, I don't know if anyone's ever done a proper long-form documentary about this story in depth, and that's where it started. What, what is the angle uh, of this? I mean, is it simply telling back the story? Is it telling what the Wetterlings have gone through? Tell us a little about that. Well, for me, it's always been about impact. Yeah. You know, it's a, it is a gripping crime story, and that's certainly going to be reflected in the film, but there's also been a lot of big changes. Uh, the Wetterlings themselves and the people around them are, are uh, really inspiring figures. Mm -hmm. Their resilience is kind of serves as an, as an inspiration and so we want we want to make sure that all that stuff is reflected yeah. in, in the film. I, I just add that there's this idea of what happens when you go through the unthinkable Yeah. and uh, despite the obvious and deep tragedy involved in this story. Um, it's also a beautiful story about, about how this family came through and held on to and still holds on to hope and hope for the world that their child believed in yeah. and that uh, all children uh, deserve. Yeah, let's talk a little more about this, but first let's take a quick look at the movie. This is right, it's right here. Bikes were. Bikes were in the ditch. The kids biked down to the Tom Thumb store, which is another half a mile, 
and you know they came back and as far as this they were going slow because two of them were on bikes but Aaron was on a foot scooter so they were going slow it was dark there's no street lights it's totally dark no moon no stars and our house is over in that circle so they were coming back from the store and this this guy just came out of nowhere I'm, I'm continually amazed at w with the ease that they're able to talk about this uh, no matter how many years later it's been how was it dealing with them trying to pull these stories out and, and really in in terms of mentally go back to that day over and over I don't think it is easy for yeah. them to talk about I, I mean it's an uh, unimaginable thing to have to talk about over and over and over again uh, I know that they you know in some way the Wetterlings decided they had to force themselves to to be out front, be very public in the media from the very beginning, all in an effort to get the word out. So hopefully the answers would, yeah. would come. And at this point, you're still looking for some crowdfunding, correct? My whole name is Jacob Irvin Wetterling. My favorite food is steak. My favorite color is blue. My best friend is Aaron Larson. My favorite, I don't really have a favorite song. My favorite game is Clue. My favorite thing to do most is watch football. My favorite sport is football. And my favorite TV show is The Cosby Show. My, what I want to be when I grow up is a football player. My favorite hobby is collecting football cards. I don't have a favorite book. And my newest friend is Gabe. I'm finished.